we discussed the topic of the great proletarian cultural revolution with Recomposition, who is researching this momentous period in history, as well as running a collective study group on it. We first asked Recomposition why they are studying the great proletarian cultural revolution and what they have found so far. Well, um, I would first like to say that I am, you know, an amateur historian and my work is really being done entirely outside of academia. So even though I work with a lot of uh, academic sources, my research is exactly uh, formalized by any institutional arrangement. Um, but like that being said, I really became interested in Marxism in general uh, in my late teens and was exposed to two critical currents. And that was uh, capital on the one hand, uh, and then uh, the history of the Chinese Revolution on the other. And so I studied uh, the Cultural Revolution for the first real time, the first serious time uh, in, um, in, in my undergrad years. Uh, so it was because of my experience of studying modern China in undergrad that I really became interested in this pretty remarkable period in, in Chinese history and pretty quickly became realized, uh, realized how uh, inadequate a lot of the major, um, major narratives are, basically. So uh, it's a really difficult, you know, it's a really difficult topic to speak of in a concise manner. Um, and I always like to say that uh, there's not just one cultural revolution. There's always many cultural revolutions, depending upon who you ask. And uh, even sometimes one person has several different uh, cultural revolutions in their mind. So I think really what kicked, uh, kicked off uh, the idea of a new interpretation was my exposure to the French philosopher Alain Badiou. Um, his essay on the cultural revolution was collected with other essays in the communist hypothesis. And so it's really from there that I learned of an interpretation that I hadn't been exposed to before, uh, an interpretation of the Cultural Revolution, which saw it something as more than just an unredeemable disaster. So it opened up the possibility that the Cultural Revolution, even though it officially failed, opened new vistas for the communist movement and is still active in the questions of the recomposition of the communist project today. Um, so I think like I can put my, you know, this list won't be exhaustive, but I can put my fi initial findings in, in kind of three categories. Uh, I would say that I'm studying the cultural revolution because it kind of forms both the apogee and the terminus of the classical communist sequence, which I rec retroactively include with, uh, other famous events like the Paris commune, uh, in 1871 and the October Revolution in 1917. Um, so the Cultural Revolution uh, actually took place between 1966 and 1976. And uh, it's kind of divided into two uh, separate parts. And that's one of the, the, the big first impressions that one gets when reading about it, basically there was the early period, which is the period of mass mobilization from 66, 1966 to 1968. And then there is a long coda or tail uh, from about late 68 uh, all the way up until Mao's death in November of 1976. And this I would kind of uh, consider a more passive and reconstitutive phase. And that's not because nothing interesting happened. It's, it's just because uh, it, it's so qualitatively different from the, from the initial part. So I'm going to reel myself back in real quick and say that my, my study kind of uh, falls into three categories right at the moment. And so first, the Cultural Revolution is, is so important because it's one of the most acute examples of the continuation of class struggle under the dictatorship of the proletariat. And in my opinion, it shows that class structure is in a way imminent to socialist society and that struggle uh, between classes will persist until communism. Uh, that is the dissolution of classes. Of course, it's a complicated uh, question and I don't really have an answer now uh, because there are two, two uh, theories to my mind that exist on the matter. And the first is uh, 
the orthodox Maoist position, which is that the contradiction between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat persists under the dictatorship of the proletariat, but the antagonism takes place entirely, uh, entirely within the party line. And then the second kind of, kind of uh, uh, position that I see uh, is that um, the socialist societies in the Soviet style uh, create their own hierarchies and there are new class antagonisms between the two. Um, I don't know the answer to either of these, but uh, I would point out that uh, Badu uh, in the theory of subject prefers the uh, former. Um, that is, that it's a, just a continuation of the contradiction between the dictatorship, or between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. So that's the first, that's the first kind of cluster. Uh, second, the Cultural Revolution provides both positive and negative models for unlimited pluralization of mass organization, uh, which both limit liberal democratic and socialist societies restricted in different capacities. So it's an interesting point because typically China, especially in the West, is kind of associated with this Orwellian control by the state, a perception that's inaccurate for many reasons. Um, but they forget that during the Cultural Revolution, most restraints on organization and freedom of speech were actually radically lifted. Uh, it was a period of incredible uh, mass mobilization for ordinary individuals and an attempt to sort of uh, spread an unlimited pluralization of organizations at, at, at the basic level um, in order to kind of Create new, uh, create new pathways to communism that didn't just rely on the traditional party state form. So uh, this is a little bit complex because uh, people point out that there were uh, the military came in and, and repressed the the event, and then also people were targeted by authorities in various purges. But um, I don't think it undermines the incredible freedom of speech that we saw flourishing uh, in China, which hadn't certainly been seen in quite some time. So one of the one of the big examples is the, the so-called Da Jipao, which are uh, big character posters. Basically, during, you know, the during during the active phase and even later, uh, everybody was basically free to put up character posters, either denouncing officials or uh, publishing some sort of manifesto or political declaration. And this was one of the main ways for working class and student uh, self-expression and political self-expression in the time, uh, the time being. Basically, you see, you see organizations in the early part of the Cultural Revolution spread everywhere, seemingly overnight. There's one in every school, one in every factory, in every office. The early stages of the mass mobilization phase are basically entirely about pluralization and providing an alternative to the, the monopoly of the Chinese Communist Party, like I said. Uh, unfortunately, the negative model uh, is the factionalism that, we, that the experiment led to. And by this, I mean every faction uh, in their respective place divided into two. And uh, they ended up fighting each other over power seizures and subsequently, these rivalries devolved into armed conflict over very little substance. So there's a kind of catastrophic uh, inversion of what was a very promising uh, political phase into a destructive uh, conflict. And sometimes students would even use mortars and rifles, and, and it got to the point of uh, tanks and artillery being possessed by civilians. And this uh, required the armed intervention by the PLA. Uh, so basically, um, to kind of sum up the second cluster, uh, the mass mobilization is both what makes it, uh, the Cultural Revolution, such a positive and a negative experience. And the negative experience really kind of comes about in that factionalism and the intervention by the PLA. Uh, because uh, Andrew Walder, in his books, Agents of Disorder, which just came out a couple of years ago, uh, he makes a really convincing case to show that the, the army intervention rather than the mass mobilization was the most, uh, the most violent part of the movement. So 
many people usually uh, associate the Cultural Revolution violence with Red Guards attacking innocent people. But the mass, mo mass mobilization killed significantly less. Uh, the violence was actually a minority trend relative to the overall proportion of organization. Uh, and instead, the restoration of order that happened uh, following late 68 uh, actually killed perhaps four to five times the number of individuals which the mass movement was responsible for. And this finding might upset some people who want to place, you know, the latter, you know, uh, the, 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 the blame on red guards. Um, but uh, it's, it's, it's important to, 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 to consider uh, and contextualize. So then third and finally, uh, the Cultural Revolution kind of de de demonstrates the exhaustion of the traditional Marxist-Leninist sequence. So it was unable to move past a certain stage in the dictatorship of the proletariat. The socialist states end up becoming mired in this halfway house between capitalism and communism. Some would call it state capitalism, but I'm not so sure I prefer that designator, although China today certainly falls under this label. Um, what it is certain is rather than the withering away of the state, the, uh, almost all the socialist states saw the obscene hypertrophy of the state and the bureaucracy. So both Lenin and Mao mourned this late, you know, late in their lives. They were quite aware of this issue. And Mao's entire tenure was basically to try to grapple with this issue and continue the revolution uh, from within the revolution. And uh, I think... Um, uh, JMP, the Marxist-Leninist Maoist uh, uh, philosopher, has said elsewhere that the Cultural Revolution, uh, one of its downsides was that it was under-theorized too little and too late. And unfortunately, I kind of agree with him, but that's the, the, the beauty of, of um, being able to you know, work on this in retrospect as a historian is that we have at least certain vantage points that weren't afforded to them uh, at that time. So the end of the Cultural Revolution, you know, really kind of uh, represents a sort of defeat uh, and a return to a kind of modified version of the, uh, the pre-Cultural Revolution status quo. Um, but, uh, but I think that still really that initial uh, mass mobilization phase between 66 and 68 are what makes the Cultural Revolution so profound and still provides lots of answers and questions as to what uh, radical egalitarian organizing would look like in the present moment. And all things told, uh, the Cultural Revolution completely defines China uh, today and the relationship with, uh, w with China that, that many of various countries have. So it's absolutely significant. And that list is not exhaustive, but I probably talked too much for that answer. So um, if you have any questions, let me know. No, that's a great uh, initial uh, summation, I guess, of what uh, what you found. Yeah, I mean, that, that uh, helps us to understand it. Like most people, I guess, including myself don't uh, don't know very much about like you know, only it's it's yeah i think you said it right it's uh, such a huge topic and it's also so under theorized it's hard to know what the heck uh, it is uh, for 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 people so that's a great great, great start anyway um well, well i mean i you already gave an answer for this one but just um i wondering like could you if you had to uh if you had to uh, say what the, the 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 cultural revolution the great proletarian cultural revolution was uh Maybe you could uh, tell us, give us an, uh, yeah, tell us what you think, what, what, what you, what you think that that is. And yeah. If you could, could you relate it also to the, the Paris Commune and the October Revolution? Yeah, absolutely. So like I said, you know, it's very difficult to sum up the Cultural Revolution concisely without the risk of major misconceptions and without potentially pissing people off. So um, I'm going to try to do my best. Uh, as you mentioned, I've, I've kind of spoken a little bit about it in the previous question, but uh, the Cultural Revolution um, was a collection of social movements that were first initiated by Mao Zedong and his uh, faction uh, within the Communist Party of China. Um, the, uh, the, the initial salvo was actually opened uh, by a critique of a play 
written by uh, the vice mayor of Beijing, Wu Han, and that play was called High Ray Dismissed from Office. It was widely seen as a, a criticism of Mao and the, the Great Leap Forward and the Purge of Peng Duhuai at the Lushan Plenum in, uh, in, the late, in the late 50s. And so this became a, ten, a contentious kind of article and had a lot to, at stake around the political role of the peasantry. And I won't get in that, to that too much, but basically I just want to make the point that the Cultural Revolution opened with a critique of a play, which is a pretty wild, uh, a wild beginning for, uh, for, for, uh, for an event like this. Um, and so the purpose of the Cultural Revolution, uh, according to uh, Mao, was to uh, target authorities in the party um, who were perceived to be heading the nation towards a capitalist restoration. Uh, this basically set off a factional struggle at the top of the party, which cascaded down the respective levels all the way down to the base of the pyramid of the Chinese Communist Party. And at each level, it caused the state itself uh, to, to, to collapse upon itself as each level uh, fought for, for power struggle. And so as these power struggles occurred, as they kind of had this domino effect downward, uh, the, mass, the mass parties and organizations which formed uh, kind of acted as auxiliaries and supports for bureaucrats within the pyramidal structure of the Chinese state uh, to target people in authority. Uh, and so you get this really interesting, you know, interesting kind of detonation, which if you imagine, like I said, if you imagine Chinese society as a pyramidal or the Chinese state as a pyramidal structure, then you have this explosion at the top and this ripple, cascading ripple down, uh, downwards from each level. And the state literally turns itself inside out. And this is caused by a combination of mass targeting of authorities at every level and a suspension of ordinary activity from the upper echelons of the party. And as the state collapses, the masses become more and more involved. And soon, at some point, what was intended to be a controlled mass movement becomes an uncontrollable social tsunami. And mass organizations of workers, students, dissident cadres overthrow local governments. Uh, for example, Shanghai's municipal government collapses in early 1967 and is replaced by what is called the Shanghai Commune. Uh, this this uh, leads to a rippling effect which causes the collapse of uh, a number of other uh, local, um, local municipalities. And pretty soon everywhere you have mass organizations allied with their bureaucratic counterparts seizing power and creating revolutionary committees in uh, each, um, you know, in each city. And so uh, there were radical innovative experiences in popular democracy and collectivization. And, uh, but at the same time, there are obvious downsides just because uh, any kind of movement like this is going to have negative, uh, negative effects, uh, although they can be more or less limited. The downsides were that sometimes innocents were targeted. People brought in their personal their personal uh, uh, grief with uh, individuals, and uh, the factionalism oftentimes kind of became entirely focused on the question of seizing power, and it made it made none of the other uh, it made none of the other considerations quite so important, and uh, and that led to innocent people who didn't particularly have any power uh, being targeted. However, I would like to say that, uh, reiterate that that was a minority actually of the, uh, the victims of the Cultural Revolution. I would say primarily the Cultural Revolution's targets were um, bureaucrats, were government officials. And um, that tends to shock people. Uh, the other the other thing that I would say is that uh, reiterate how that factionalism uh, became so severe that that it got to the point to where people were literally using uh, anti-aircraft guns and tanks against one another 
Um, but uh, that actually is, is dealt with pretty well uh, by several scholars, and I can mention some later. So basically, you have this initial mass mobilization, which really, like, uh, it starts as a bureaucratic struggle. It turns into, it turns into a uh, popular insurrection against the party state. And then uh, it becomes so uncontrollable that uh, Mao is forced to make kind of a reconciliation with certain parts of the party apparatus, and they call in the PLA to restore order uh, at a great cost to human life. And that actually, ironically, ended up devastating the radical left, uh, and pay it paved the way to a virtual military uh, dictatorship by uh, by 69 and 70, um, which Mao would later reverse, but uh, it certainly wasn't uh, his intentional goal. So the active phase has kind of ended with the PLA intervention uh, and the Ninth Party Congress in 1969, where Lin Biao is elevated to successor. Um, but, uh, but because the Cultural Revolution is traditionally uh, understood as lasting until Mao's death, like we have to really deal with the, the second part. And I'm just going to say a little bit here, but so it marks Lin Biao's, uh, the, the defense ministers and head of the military, it marks his rise to, to, to relative power. He becomes the second most powerful man in, in China. And then at some point, there appears to have been some sort of power struggle that went on at the upper left echelons of the uh, the Communist Party, and Lin Biao ends up dying under myster mysterious circumstances, allegedly having uh, allegedly having flown, uh, attempted to flee to the Soviet Union in a plane, and crashing in Mongolia. And it's still really not clear what uh, what happened there, but it marked a severe turning point in the last half of the Cultural Revolution, and and severely, it really severely uh, dented a lot of ordinary people's fate. In, in the event because they suddenly felt that they had been manipulated and that this person who was portrayed to be, you know, Mao's com closest comrade in arms, you know, was suddenly turned out to be a, a traitor. And so that kind of revelation is pretty, is pretty devastating emotionally for, for many people. Um, but, uh, but this, this phase continues and it, and I really think of it as a period of Thermidorian reaction because, uh, Mao is, is steadily losing his health. He's suffering uh, from ALS and heart trouble. And meanwhile, uh, the Gang of Four, the so-called Gang of Four, the, the revolutionaries, uh, including Mao's wife, are really unable to create an alternative uh, uh, and sustainable political uh, uh, inheritor to, to Mao's rule. And he's quite aware of this. So he's ultimately forced to bring uh, Deng Xiaoping, who had been earlier uh, suppressed by the movement and targeted as one of the, the, the highest uh, positions of authority taking the capitalist road. Um, but Deng Xiaoping uh, kind of has a halting involvement of trying to reconstitute the political order. And Mao himself makes a turn towards the United States uh, in order to offset their uh, the, 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 the power balance of the Soviet Union, with whom they have a small border war in 1969. And uh, so I don't know, like, even though there were some positive aspects, there was a continuation of debate in the cultural sphere in an attempt to answer what exactly the mass mobilization thing had meant. Uh, it, it, the, I, I kind of find the latter, you know, bit quite depressing. And and in some ways hard to explain, but I think that it just merely shows that uh, Mao himself had not, you know, ha had basically had this plan in a way backfire upon him and he had to do everything he could to try to preserve the, uh, the, the, the socialist state in the wake of the active phase. So I've said a lot about the Cultural Revolution, but I, I basically want to try to situate it a little bit uh, with the Paris Commune and uh, and the October Revolution. Uh, so um, basically, I think the Cultural Revolution marks what I believe to be the end of the historical communist sequence. Uh, 
which Sylvain Lazarus and Alain Badiou refer to as the saturation of the party state form. Uh, so I go back and include the Paris Commune in the sequence, but there is some debate as to whether it should be linked more closely to the French Revolution or the Rus Russian Revolution. And partly I think this classification uh, with the Russian Revolution is more apt, but this is partly a decision made by me as a communist who believes that the commune is a new mode of doing politics, which was active in later episodes. So I see the Cultural Revolution, therefore, as the final episode in a trajectory marked by three typical examples, three episodes, including the Paris Commune of 1871, the October Revolution of 1917, and the Cultural Revolution, specifically from 1966 to 68. And each episode marks a new stage in revolutionary struggle. Uh, while resolving certain contradictions, uh, it also in the process each also poses new contradictions. So the Paris Commune is like basically the classical worker insurrection, and we see episodes like it time and time again uh, throughout the 20th century. But I think it really kind of sets sets the stage for the new revolutionary movement to come. Um, so obviously, uh, it was a brave experiment in direct worker control of the city of Paris, but it was unable to maintain itself in the face of, of military reaction. And so the decentralized forces of revolution and the centralized forces of, of the military uh, kind of resulted in utter defeat of the, uh, the communards and a destruction of the revolutionary generation in Paris for quite some time. So this really wouldn't become resolved until October 1917, the so-called October Revolution, uh, led by the Bolsheviks under Vladimir Lenin. And uh, this actually attempted to uh, and effectively answered the problem of the commune and the, the military incapacity. The answer, as we know, is, is, uh, is because uh, of the disciplined and organized party that would become so heavily identified with Lenin. Um, but then this also turns around and ultimately kind of creates its own questions that need to be resolved. And the party form, while it's really good at taking power and securing, you know, the, the, the dictatorship of the proletariat is, uh, it's also a sort of Pyrrhic victory. So we see that the Soviet Union ceased eventually at some point, and this is also, a, a, you know, up for huge debate, but at some point, the Soviet Union ceased to be a re revolutionary state uh, and instead kind of became a technocratic revisionist power. And the contradiction therein kind of generally becomes one between the party state and the masses. And that's a contradiction that in the most broad terms affects virtually all the socialist states that developed in the 20th century, although there are very many local differences in each situation. And I would say that the Cultural Revolution in turn uh, marks the final stage insofar as it tries to answer this contradiction, the appearance of bureaucracy, the, the increase of technocracy and um, sort of market kind of uh, answers. Uh, it, it does this by calling upon mass mobilization in co conjunction with the, uh, the reorganization of the state. And it pushes those contradictions to the limit, but it ultimately proved impossible in the given position, uh, given conditions. And so it saturated the party state form. I honestly don't see um, how we can exactly return to the, the traditional uh, vanguard party as it, was, uh, as it was envisaged in the 20th century. So we're still living in the problematic set before us by the Cultural Revolution. And I would say uh, that it is indeed the last great revolution for this generation. It is the revolution uh, that hangs over the entire socialist movement, whether people know it or not. Um, so that uh, that kind of generally situates my thesis on the matter. All right. Yeah. Well, that's a big uh, chunk of history. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, I, I think yes. I think other people. I, th I think a lot of uh, revolutionaries should be studying exactly from the Paris Commune to the to the to the Shanghai Commune and the uh, Cultural Revolution. But Definitely a lot of unanswered questions, particularly for um, people who are concerned with uh, future revolutions and how they will yeah. look. But, um, well, 
And yeah, I guess this feeds into the next question, which is just about, um, well, I mean, historical research. I mean, the, uh, if I understand it, uh, I mean, there hasn't been very much. I think I, I was reading, uh, I, you know, I think that there have been, uh, um, yeah, uh, has there been much historical research and theorizing on the Cultural Revolution? Um, yeah, well, I mean, I'm sure you, you've uh, looked at what's, what's out there there what 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 how much uh, work has been done on it yeah that's a great question it's actually in some ways the answer is there's quite a bit that has been done but uh, there's there's a lot of uh, literature available and many local studies have been made that are invaluable understanding but unfortunately i, I mean suppose, unfortunately i suppose could i could i ask you i mean yeah just sorry just to maybe tie into yeah. that like i mean i guess maybe it's worth uh, uh uh, to, um, categorizing them like whether they are written by academics. I guess you just mentioned local studies. That that sounds interesting. But like you know, I, I suppose there's a lot of academic type studies versus you know the theoretical uh, uh, studies by communists ra rather than like I don't know professors. Like maybe it's worth um, uh, pointing out which is which. Yeah. So there has been. Um... There's been, a, there, there's been a deal of both. There have been uh, a handful of, uh, you know, addresses by various Marxist, Leninist, Maoist groups, um, as well as some uh, militants from other traditions. Uh, but it's, you know, it's really, it's really fragmentary and, and not complete to the degree that I would imagine, given the degree of import of the, the event. And so on one side, you get the you get a you get a, a decent collection of academic studies, which are useful, but they don't necessarily take the the sort of perspective of um, the revolutionary kind of concept. And I mean, I'm limited by the fact that I don't really speak Chinese at the moment, which I'm trying to rectify. Uh, but uh, but. Like I said, it's kind of fragmentary, and the older literature that we see is outdated. The only full-length, full-book-length Marxist history that I'm aware of is actually by an Italian Trotskyist named Livio Matan. Uh, I believe I'm pronouncing his name right. Uh, but at this point, it's pretty outdated and really only useful as a reference. And you know, I have differences uh, with with uh, with the Trotskyist analysis, but I won't go into that here. Um, basically, the biggest lacuna, lacuna um, from what I can tell, has been the absence of a complete comprehensive Marxist analysis of the Cultural Revolution. And what I would like to see is a single work which deals with the entire chronology of this period while also mulling the lessons from a communist perspective. So something that synthesizes the... Um, the kind of academic side with a more active militant side. And I think that there's, I actually do think that there's lots of great work out there uh, in both categories, but um, I want to see something more complete. Uh, and I think the final thing that I would say about that would be uh, that most of my work, uh, you know, the kind of core is inspired by the politics of Alain Badiou, who, aside from being an academic, has also been a lifelong long militant, along with his colleague uh, Lazarus. And I think that they both kind of provide a general set of hypotheses off which we can base uh, a militant study. So, yeah. Right, right. Um... Well, I mean, uh, so yeah, so I, I guess uh, following on from that, uh, um, new interpretations of the Cultural Revolution. Um, what uh, what uh, way of people, what ways of people interpreted it, uh, it that you've seen and what are the, the stakes of them doing so? Absolutely. So this is this is a big issue um, and it's probably the decisive issue. The dominant narrative um, is, as we know, it's basically that the Cultural Revolution was 10 years of madness. Uh, it was not only a period of economic ruin, it came at an immense cost of human life, uh, had no real political issues at stake, and was ultimately 
the machinations of Mao, who was simply trying to uh, cynically work his way back into power uh, after his disastrous failure in the Great Leap Forward. And ironically, this narrative, which is very misleading, um, is shared not just by anti-communists in the West, but also the Chinese Communist Party. On this, they actually agree. And ironically, you see liberals almost supporting the kind of Stalinist mode of doing politics uh, to the sort of mass mobilization that, uh, that Mao envisaged, uh, which I always find ironic. And so really kind of the first major issue of interpretation is whether or not the Cultural Revolution was pure disaster or if it was something which can offer positive emancipatory lessons. Um, uh, one of the examples that I think of for the dominant uh, perspective is that uh, there's a high circulation of so-called scar literature, uh, which has accounts of people who are targeted by the Cultural Revolution for various reasons. And while they have value, they're not, they're not appropriately contextualized when they're taught, at least from my experience in high school, because uh, one of the examples is the problem with the presentation of the Red Guards. So we've become familiar with Red Guards as gangs of fanatical teenagers who blindly follow Mao and target innocents, you know, including elderly and academics and destroying Buddhist temples. But uh, when we look at this in the wider context, this image is distorted to smear the entire movement. Basically, the Red Guard movement was uh, included everyone, and the violent actions were you know, as, although they were bad and although they were real, they were actually in a minority um, of, of the activities. Uh, most Red Guards were, were peaceful and even intervened uh, when violence was used. Uh, the, so it collapses, you know, it collapses the entire experience into the repressive downsides without giving the wider context that people were responding to real social issues. And even so, much of the violence came from parts of the state trying to preserve their privilege and their control. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's like the first kind of major issue, the titanic struggle. And then there are others that kind of are more interior to the communist, uh, the communist uh, idea. And the second one, so like the Cultural Revolution, people like to say that either the Cultural Revolution was a cynical power struggle, you know, at the top, or it was a mass experiment in emancipatory politics. And I actually think the truth is, is that it can be both at the same time. Um, I don't think Mao's intentions were entirely pure, but like it's also undeniable that he, uh, that he really believed in what he was doing. And I think he was authentically trying to bring about a, uh, an emancipatory situation. Um, some other stakes are whether or not uh, class struggle can be considered the defining kind of category of, uh, of a revolutionary politics. Because as we see in the factionalism, a lot of the factions didn't really express substantial differences in class background or political orientation. And that's one of the uh, big kind of riddles of the entire event as to why that happened. And Andrew Walder actually describes it in a couple of his books, uh, Agents of Disorder and uh, Fractured Rebellion. Um, but that's also something that Assad Haider mentioned in his recent article for The Point. And um, I tried to engage with that some on my own Twitter because I think that that kind of affects how we would understand and value mass mobilization. So the other issues is whether class struggle uh, continues under a social society. Um, then there's the kind of dichotomy between what's called dismissal and pluralization. So dismissal would be uh, between the, the removal of political opponents by violent or nonviolent means. And that's usually the rule of politics is how politics works. But uh, pluralization, which means the opening up to other you know, modes of organization in conjunction with one another. 
uh, was really the main takeaway of the Cultural Revolution. And the two, dismissal and pluralization, became antagonistic to one, one another, and then dismissal ruled, uh, ended up uh, kind of cannibalizing and rendering inoperative the latter. So that's, that's another major issue, and that's covered by, also by Alessandro Russo, um, who's a great scholar of the Cultural Revolution. Um, and then the last kind of bundle that I would really say would be significant are how we understand state socialism, uh, you know, both in an economic kind of framework and in terms of um, how class society persists under, under socialist uh, rule and under the dictatorship of the proletariat. Uh, we need to also, you know, argue uh, a positive kind of example for the Cultural Revolution because uh, I don't think we should or can interpret state socialism as a pure failure. Uh, it's quite obviously more complex than that. And I think that um, we can extract these emancipatory and pluralistic uh, interpretations in order to build, um, rebuild a party. Uh, and so the Cultural Revolution really shows a kind of limitation of that old way of doing politics and instead points towards the famous party of the new type. And I'm not really capable of saying what that would look like. Uh, I think the militants in the real movement will actually end up determining that and not historians. But I can say that the Cultural Revolution ends up kind of demonstrating that whatever happens next, it will need to be able to balance centralized organization with decentralized mass mobilization and mass organizations will be absolutely critical to any future communist politics. Yes, that's a big question, both uh, before the revolution and, uh, and obviously after it, like uh, in the context that you're talking about. So yeah, we need to get that balance right. And uh, yeah, you touched on a lot of big issues there. Um, and when you're talking about whether uh, whether the Cultural Revolution should be seen as a uh, a mass emancipation or like a cynical power game by the elites, uh, it actually got me uh, reminded me of um, a stupid show, Game of Thrones. But they actually <laughs> did that pretty yeah. well. With uh, they would have you know like the 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 the, the characters of the kings at the top going down with like the storylines of the the lowly lowly people at the bottom so i think what we need is a 10 series uh multi-hour long uh exploration of of uh of this uh of, of uh, the cultural revolution to uh start to understand it but um could you could you tell us a bit about your research methods and your your sources on uh studying this period in history yeah um I just wanted to say briefly that a TV show about the Cultural Revolution would be tremendously entertaining, um, to say the least. But uh, uh, because it, it in, in some ways, uh, was very theatrical in and of itself. Um, so as far as my research methods and sources, so I wanted to kind of restate that I am handicapped by my inability to, to, to fluently speak the read Chinese. Uh, so that's actually something I'm working on. Uh, it's, it's making slow, uh, slow progress, but, uh, that prohibits a lot of access to primary literature, which is invaluable for the study. So I'm still, you know, a newcomer relatively to, to getting deeply involved in the cultural revolution. So my sources are generally secondary literature. So this includes like histories and interpretations. But this is uh, buttressed by any, you know, primary literature that I can find available. And those tend to be like state polemics, you know, during the Cultural Revolution period, um, whether they came from like internal party documents, like the May 16th notice, the decision in 16 points, or, you know, to political essays uh, by the likes of Zhang Chun Chao uh, on the dictatorship of the proletariat. And then the last example that I can think of of this sort of primary source material would be the famous ultra-left essay called Wither China, 
and that was written by a group called the Shang Wu Lian. Um, that's, this latter one is famous because it ended up condemning the entire Chinese state as uh, bureaucracy and was suppressed by the Chinese authorities, but nonetheless, it was it was a surprising kind of document. So these, uh, you know, my, my methods really have been to begin with the mainstream literature, to start at a general, like, high-level history that is not necessarily written in a Marxist perspective. So, for example, I started with uh, Roderick McFarquhar's uh, uh, Mao's Last Revolution, and that gave me a general feeling for the dominant discourse on the Cultural Revolution, and it gave me a political reference point that allowed me to dive into critical reading of these. Uh, so from there, I began to work with Marxian interpretations of the event and generally became more focused on microscopic studies of particular episodes in the Cultural Revolution. For example, um, Proletarian Power by Elizabeth Perry and Li Shun, uh, which deals with the politics of Shanghai's working class politics. Uh, uh, you know, situation, the commune and the revolutionary committee, which followed. In general, I would say that my process, you know, has been to begin with the general, move to the particular, and then move back to the general uh, for a reevaluation. And so some of the other scholars that I uh, have been a huge influence on me are Andrew Walder, um, Wu Yiqing is one, uh, Dong Ping Han, Mo Bo Gao, and there's there's really there's really quite a bit that's you know that's that's out there, but I hope to be able to begin delving into archival uh, primary material sometime in the near future. Uh, I think that would really help. That sounds like that'll be fun. Um... And you're also are running a GPC, GCPR, a Great Cultural Revolution, a Great Proletarian Cultural Revolution uh, study group at the moment. How is that going? Yeah, so it's, it's still in the early stages, so it hasn't quite taken off yet. Um, we will be doing weekly discussions online on various material. So we began with Alain Badiou's essay on the Cultural Revolution. And now we're currently working our way through Maurice Meisner's history of the PRC. Uh, so we're hoping to create a self-sustaining group to engage in a sort of self-teaching project about the event and uh, even possibly start to engage in novel research and interpretation. Um, I do think that it will pick up pace and transform as we go along. Right now, uh, we're welcoming anyone and encouraging anyone to join. Uh, and if you want to do that, just uh, you can contact me at Twitter. And it's my, uh, my handle is Recomposition. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's, it's a work in progress, but, um, I have hope that it will be, uh, it, it'll be a fruitful pro project and I kind of want anyone to, to feel, feel like they can join. Well, that sounds very exciting. And, uh, just from what, whatever I, I've seen and what, what from anyone can see that the, the cultural revolution itself was such an exciting, uh, period in time, I think people will really uh, probably get, I'm sure they'll get a good kick from uh, from researching it. So it should be, uh, I, I would say it's a bit of fun as well as really useful research is how I guess. So um, hopefully, uh, hope, I hope it uh, goes very well. Um, is there any, uh, any other issues you'd like to talk about or any final words you'd like to say? Yeah. Um, so uh, I think I've really I maybe said too much, but, uh, but uh, the last thing that I want to to mention is that I am, you know, interested in the intersection between certain faith traditions and uh, and Marxism, and so I'm personally a practicing Buddhist, and so I have a kind of side interest in the effects of the Cultural Revolution and the Chinese state in general on the Tibetan experience, and I think that. It's also a very contentious issue because uh, not only because of the politicization that, that comes about, but because uh, I think that the, uh, the, the, the People's Republic um, perhaps didn't handle it as well as they could have, uh, that, they, uh, that, that it really intersects with issues of great power chauvinism and 
a kind of failure of, of, of the principle of national self-determination. Uh, on the other hand, there were many problems with, uh, with Tibetan society prior to, uh, prior to uh, the uh, incorporation into the Chinese state. Um, but but uh, I think that we don't necessarily in the future need to, as communists, need to be so antagonistic towards, uh, towards various faith traditions. And I wonder uh, what way that, uh, that can kind of be achieved in the present moment. So that's like, you know, that's a little side project. Um, it, it, uh, you know, it, it plays, it plays some, you know, of a role in what I, what I post online and I hope to be commenting more about in the future, but, uh, you know, it's really not you know, necessary to my oeuvre. Um, the, uh, maybe the last little bit is that, uh, I um, I have I have a pretty good feeling about the development of cultural revolution um, cultural revolution history, and I think that these new interpretations are really starting to take shape, and it's encouraging, and I think it belongs to part of a general recomposition of the communist project uh, for the 21st century, and. Uh, theory always kind of lags behind uh, history, you know. Um, so the uh, and so any philosophy or any theory kind of has as its conditions concrete movements, and I think of the Cultural Revolution in itself as being the kind of founding event of Maoism or a sort of post-Leninist politics, um, and uh, and. I think the more we see uh, these new forms of communism develop, uh, the more sophisticated will be the uh, will be the, uh, the the impressions that we get of the Cultural Revolution. And if I can just contribute a tiny bit, you know, if I can tr- just contribute a sentence to that project, I will be happy. So I think that sums it up. 